what the hell these are tears of joy man this was Dude. crazy this was crazy <laughs> this was oh, crazy man. thankfully i was on mute came like a bloody shocker man Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to OD on Music. Classic rock. Two words which bring back so much nostalgia. And there's one band which brings in a lot of nostalgia. And that's who we're talking about. Dire Straits. He's doing all right. He can play the home. the sultans with the sultans of swing we have an excellent panel here today as you can see it's chock a block full of people here because there are so many people who love dire straits and we needed to get everybody and anybody who was here so let's go to the panel let's meet them first let's say hi to sahib singh <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's absolutely our pleasure. Following Sahib, we have another guitarist, the guitarist from One Night Stand, who, from experience and from the experience of lots of people in the participants have told us, is the top guitarist in a Dire Straits tribute band in India, Mr. Sarosh oh. Isenyar. <laughs> the talk hi sarosh how are you doing hi good evening there you are and uh, sarosh as you can see is all kitted up and he's ready to give us a taste of the dire straits stone and the founder of a four mention one night stand the great paddy where the sultans where the sultans of swing Hi Paddy how are you thank Hi, you for joining hey, us and a special guest is Mr Jatin Paranjme Hi Jatin thank you for joining us in your very busy schedule No no thank you for having me this is one of my passions in life Okay so who were the Dire Straits Dire Straits was a band which was formed in the UK first because of two people called John Ailsley and David Knopfler so they met up when they were in college and uh, David told John Ailsley i have a brother an elder brother who plays the guitar and he writes songs so John says okay bring him over let's start a band and legend has it that was Mark Knopfler joins a band the three of them start dire straits uh now here's the interesting thing there are lots of stories about why they are called dire straits from john ailsley himself we realize dire straits is the financial situation they were in at that point of time they were all sociology students uh, uh mark knopfler was working as a journalist and if you're following our twitter account you will uh, you will be able to know that when his first job as a journalist in the yorkshire evening post was to write the obituary for jimmy hendrix so very interesting coincidence there so that's where we get dire straits and then they went on to rule the world now the first person i want to talk to is our super special guest jatin okay so jatin can you just tell us about how you got into dire straits okay and why dire straits one of my sister's friends from bombay uh, used to come over pretty often to our house and uh, he used to uh, you know play some music at home and and one of those albums happened to be dire straits dire straits and i just loved the i just loved the sound the first song uh, which i've heard is uh, water of love 
and I completely was floored. And I I went up to his house the next day. I said, "Do you have any? Have they made any other music?" So he said, "Yeah, yeah, they have a couple of other albums." So I said, "Can I borrow those tapes from you?" So it became my ritual, you know. I, you know, I've been a cricketer, used to be a cricketer, and and uh, one of the things a, a coach told me was, you know, the bat is an expression of your hands, and 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 when I when I used to hear uh, Nofler, I would feel that, and and when I hear Sarosh as well, great guitarist, uh, I I feel that the guitar is an extension of his hands, uh, you know. So. Uh, so, so th- that's that's what got me into it. I, you know, you didn't have lyrics and stuff like that at that time. I, I would, I, I hope I find it somewhere. But I've written some bizarre interpretations of those <laughs> lyrics. So, so I think the, you know, I, I heard them first in eighty four, eighty five, and the melody uh, was what uh, struck me. I'm glad you brought up the lyrics thing. We're going to talk about that later. Okay, let's now talk to Paddy. Paddy, can you tell us about how you got into Dire Straits and? Why did I stay? So the main reason is, of course, uh, because of the guy sitting over here, Jatin Paranjwe, and his American Top 40 tapes, and uh, him coming to my house. That's that was my introduction to Dire Straits, and after that, I fell in love. And I st- I, I went back to Jatin, asking the same thing that he asked his cousin, that what are the other music that you have of Dire Straits, and he gave me everything. And I'll tell you something more about Jatin. I think at one point in time, Jatin had. Ten tapes, ten CDs of each of Dire Straits album because he used to keep lending it to friends and they used to not give it back to him. <laughs> he sounds like uh, a good friend. <laughs> <laughs> Sarosh, can you tell us about how your life got intervened with Dire Straits? Yeah, the first time I ever heard uh, Dire Straits was during this uh, for Africa concert, which was being shown. I had put the television on. And the person on screen was uh, Mark Knopfler playing. And I looked at him and I heard him uh, playing the guitar and all that, and I just, I just thought that if if I am learning the guitar, then I have to play like this guy. Otherwise, there's no point. <laughs> Uh, and then i realized that okay playing this is something else now you have to sing along with that because he's doing that and his singing is like talking you know like uh, and it's just coming anywhere i'm so, glad you said the talking thing so my dad long time back i remember this very clearly we were playing some song of us abhilash and i were playing and my dad comes in and he's like wait wait i know this Tone. I know this guy. Who is this guy? And my dad, my uh, Abhilash was like, yeah, yeah, that's Mark Knopfler. And my dad in Tamil says, "Avandane, avunum peswa, guitarum peso," which in English means he's the guy. He also talks and he also makes yeah, the guitar talk. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, wise words. Well, songs of swing or something like that, you need a kind of a thinner sound because a lot of the time I'm playing, I'm v- vibrating, say, three strings at once. <laughs> And and it's quite nice to have the the little choir effect of the the. I'm trying to to make the thing speak. Now let's say hi to Sahib. By the way, in the chat, people are uh, Sahib during the thing chat. Uh, somebody had put up saying uh, Sahib is the closest I have seen live play to Mark Knopfler. Right? What? Yeah, that oh that was the chat. So now that's the segue for you to tell us about. Thank you, whoever that was. You made my life. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get into Dire Straits? Well, uh, what I want to say, yeah, I mean, unlike the rest of the panel here, I'm uh, you know relatively a lot younger. So I had VH1, and um, on VH1, the first time I watched the the Money for Nothing video. Initially, it was it was the video, right, that first caught yeah. my attention. I saw that guitar just come up. you know with the neon lights and his headband with that neon lights and i was just like whoa what is this like am i in the future what's happening <laughs> and then that guitar riff of course that guitar riff comes in and i was so oh by the way before i quickly talk to sahib we have a super special guest who i'm going to come ask on video we have the actual founder and bassist of dire straits john ailsley joining us
Hi John. Good afternoon. Good afternoon everybody. Hello. How are hey. you doing John? John. John, thanks a lot for forming the Hire Straits. <laughs> oh well, it was a, it was Thank a pleasure so for me. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun together. And, uh, uh, yeah. In the excitement, a couple of our panelists have muted themselves. I'm going to unmute them. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, we are all huge fans. Needless to say, it's Hello. an honor to see you here. Uh, uh, these are tears of joy because uh, <laughs> I I started playing bass uh, with a Die Straits song, and thanks to Sarosh, I learned the bass parts. And uh, I'm so happy to see you here. It's re- and and Bertie didn't tell us that you're you here, <laughs> so it's it's uh, just a huge honor. Well, Sarosh, thank you. I, I, I'm sort of uh, humbled by how many uh, people there are, are are into our music. I think that's that's rather lovely. I mean, uh, despite the, the cultural differences, uh, I find it fascinating. People from all over the world can communicate uh, with music. Uh, John, I just want to be uh, <clears throat> slightly formal here. We are like we're completely taken aback seeing you. Uh, as we've grown older. Uh, the, the songs uh, mean so much more to us uh, and take different textures you know to the lives we are leading so so would love to pick your brains on that but but thank you so much appreciate it well it's, it's my pleasure um well if you if you've ever tried writing a song it's not the easiest thing in the world to do i mean you can you might get a few words together and a few chords together but actually getting the songs to make sense to other people and um is 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 not easy and i think that uh, mark had a remarkable gift with um with lyrics and um with melody and i think the combination of that and the other musicians in dire straits the original dire straits was uh a fairly unique um moment and and of course as i said earlier you never know when these moments are going to happen and um i having played in a lot of bands before Uh, as soon as I started to play with Mark and and David, um, I realized that we had something um, different. You know, at first start, I never heard a person play the guitar like that. <laughs> and uh, you probably never will. <laughs> I think what gives me a lot of pleasure and I've spoken to Mark about this on a number of occasions is the fact that uh people around the world in different countries seem to be able to enjoy the music as much as everybody else around the world and that's quite an I think that's quite unusual. Yeah, first of all John, I would like to say like the reason I'm a musician today is because of Dire Straits. Uh the music, the lyrics, the guitar work all of it all of it has just inspired me to yeah. pick up the guitar i have a cherry red strat because of uh, mark nofler and that was my first guitar and um, i just want to ask you like in terms of uh, continuing what you're talking about song writing in terms of uh, song writing if whenever mark you know brought up a song or whatever lyric whatever small idea how how did you guys take it forward in terms of arrangement or you know completing the whole song well it's a good question sometimes uh, he would come to the studio or we'd be sitting around in the flat just strumming guitars together and he said i had this i've had this idea for something and and um and he'd start plucking the guitar and i'd say that's pretty good and that was romeo and juliet <laughs> and there's a national steel guitar one day i was sitting there was playing around on this and came up with a romeo and juliet just because of the nature of the guitar the, the thing is that what happens when musicians play together as you know because you're all musicians something on 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 a few occasions is magically happens mm, right. and i think um you've just got to uh listen to what everybody else is doing and as i say with mark sometimes the songs would come pretty well set and and formed but other times he would just come along with a couple of chords and he always had the lyrics he always had okay. the words down um that was one thing that 
really didn't change. And um, but the music often changed, and and often we would work on something, and we'd all sort of turn around to each other and go, "Well, this one's just not working. Let's leave it." And Mark was straight away saying, "Okay, put that to one side. I'll work on that later." And you know, it's it's a very much a a, a mutual respect for each uh, musician's ability, you know. And I think that um, I was talking to Mark about this the other day because um, I'm actually just finished writing a book about my time in the band, and um, I was talking to him about it. And I, I said to him, "What do you think would have happened if you'd um, if you'd played your music with other people right from the beginning?" And he said, "Well, it would have been completely different." It wouldn't yeah. have been, it would not be what we hear today. For sure. And so it, it is the unique uh, moment when certain musicians get together and have a sympathy uh, for each other. Mm. Very important. Long, awesome. A rather long-winded way of answering your question, but... <laughs> no, no, makes sense. I get that completely. Saroj? Yeah. Uh, would you like to, uh, you know, I... I, I don't know if I should say it. I would just uh, uh, like to ask one thing is that from all the albums that we have heard of Dire Straits, there was this one album which was totally different in terms of the chord progression views, like uh, the album Love Over Gold. Private yeah. Investigations is one of my favorite songs yeah. for that matter. Is there a deliberate uh, thought behind this? It's really not a, an easy question to answer, to be honest, because each album um, is, for me, uh, uniquely different. And each album was approached differently and uh, recorded differently. I think if we had had all the time that we spent on Brothers in Arms on the first album, it would have sounded completely different. But we had three weeks to do it. With Brothers in Arms, we had sort of three months. But taking your question about Love of the Gold, to stop ourselves from getting bored when we were touring, <laughs> we, we started to play around with um, Telegraph Road in sound checks. So all the bits that were worked on separately just ideas between us as we were, we were just sound checking on the stage. And so we worked all that out for that song on the road. So by the time we got into the studio, it was pretty much formed. Um, Private Investigations was completely different. I mean, that we had to approach that song from a completely different perspective because essentially it was just him just playing very simply on the guitar. And I worked out the progression on the bass, obviously, to go with all the different changes. And it was kind of like a, a massive experiment, actually, <laughs> which thankfully came off. But it, it's an intriguing record, because, and, and for some people, it's their favorite. Uh, but, you know, it's quite difficult to actually think about what's somebody's favorite record, and everybody has their different uh, ideas on that. Yeah. We could we could go down this path and just keep asking him questions, but I just think for to understand uh, and, and get a little bit of an insight into the fact that we are all like complete. Uh, you know, John, they say you have a term called cricket tragics. Uh, we we are dire straits tragics, basically. <laughs> so, uh, well, it's it's, a, it's not a very nice word to use. I mean, you're not very tragic at all. I think you're, you <laughs> seem like a lovely bunch of people to me. I, um, and the fact that you like the music is an added bonus. Uh, yeah. could, you, could you tell us a little bit about uh, your, you know, Dire Straits' days in Germany uh, before you guys became really, really uh, popular and known? Like most bands, we did an awful lot of um, uh, small shows with very few people in them quite often. And then when the, the album did was doing very well in Holland, the German record company were refusing to put it out in Germany, the first album. They said, we don't think this record will do well in Germany. It's, it's not right, the German market. And in fact, actually, the only, the only way, way it came out was because two DJs, and they started playing Soldier Swing on the radio, and everybody said, 
who is that? What's going on here? Why can't we have that record in Germany? And the German record company was kind of forced into releasing it. And of course, and then suddenly it just went shh, like this. And then the, Ger the German people just sort of seemed to absolutely love it. So we suddenly went from playing in, in front of 50 people to 500 and then to 5,000, you know, in a very short period of time in Germany. And it was quite scary. You know, we were still a simple four piece and, you know, we had very simple lights and we had to get more lights in and more crew and more sound. And we had to we had to learn very, very quickly. And we did most of that actually, funnily enough, it's a good question because we did most of that in Germany because the German market suddenly took off like crazy. I mean, it was, it was very odd. I think we we still have the sort of the some kind of a German record having uh, number one and number two in the in the in the charts. When Communique was released, it went straight to number one, and, and Dire Straits, the first album, was at number two. And I don't think it's ever happened before and that's, since. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. It was it was quite weird. Yeah, the Germans really went for it in a big way. Uh, the guy behind Original Dog, uh, the CEO, he has a question. Uh, John, have you ever listened to or do you listen to any Indian music? Is there any that had uh, influenced you or is there anything that you really like from the Indian diaspora? Uh, I think that's a very difficult question because it's, it's an enormous subject. And uh, I really, I love the atmosphere of, of, of Indian music, but I don't, I don't, re I don't fully understand it. It's very complex because you use notation is very different in your in, in, in Indian music, which is completely fascinating. It's completely unique. Um, I've been to India a couple of times and um, you know, uh, seen people play, and I'm completely transfixed by, <laughs> by how they how they make how they make the music. I mean, it's extraordinary. Um, but uh, yes, I, I, I wish I did know a bit more about it. But you know, the, the, the problem is, is it, I find as I get older, there's just less and less time to, to <laughs> take on things. And uh, there's so much, so much coming at us now from all over the place. Uh, it's, you have to sort of pick and choose what you get involved with. I'm really, I'm really terribly bad at keeping up with modern music. I mean, my children, play me things from time to time, Dad, you should listen to this and stuff, and I do, and they, and they, they know the sort of things that I like, but there is so much content out there now, it, it's 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 almost mind-blowing. Well, it's, uh, it, it's we, very uh, difficult to keep up. I'm pretty sure on behalf of everybody, I would like to invite you to India at any point of time, any band you want to listen to, we are all there to help you get <laughs> and to, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> hang out with you and listen to the music at the same time. My favorite track of yours is One World, because you have there's this very distinct slap bass that you're doing and it's on a really really uh, how do I say this there's the accents and then you get a higher octave slap and a pop that is brilliant I mean I don't know how you came up with that part for that but I love well, that I have to be I have to be completely honest I didn't play that part what no I didn't play that part because that's not, that's, you know, that's not my style. Huh, th that's why I thought it was very different. Yeah, no, I, 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 I would never lie about something like that. We, we got somebody in and um, I can't play that style. I've never been able to play it. It's just not my, I was thing. wondering. I, I, because... just said, I just said to Mark, you know, you can have to get somebody else in now. I can't do this. Oh, interesting. Okay, I, that's a I, challenge we, for me. Did, when, when we played it live, I played it completely differently and it worked fine, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, but uh, so you know, I was you know I, I I played it the way that it should be played, but uh, there was a feeling. I think Mark wanted that kind of slap thing, and I said, "Fine, you know, oh, get somebody in who could slap the bass, man, because I don't do that kind of thing. I like to stroke my basses, not slap them." <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm going to put that on a poster behind me. That's going to be, that's going on a poster. Uh, Jatin, uh, you the... asked you asked me a little while ago about Germany. Yeah. Right. I'll briefly tell you the story. We were due to play in Bremen as a four-piece. This was 1979. And the weather was unbelievably bad from snow. We'd sold 2,000 tickets, I think, at this venue in Bremen. And the roads were all shut, right? You couldn't actually get to Bremen. 
So we, we phoned up and we said, look, you know, uh, we, uh, how can we get there to the promoter? And he said, well, you can get on the train because the trains have got the snow plows. Yeah. And so we, the crew loaded all the equipment onto the train. <laughs> <laughs> and us as well. And uh, we, we got the train with all our equipment up to Bremen, which is quite a long way. It was a couple of hours because they couldn't go very quickly. And we got to we got to Bremen, and you there was so much snow in the the station, the railway station. You couldn't see cars. It was just sort of lumps like this, you know. There was something like about six feet of snow. Somehow or other, the promoter got a truck to get to the station, put all the equipment on, and we get we got to the hall. It was bigger than we thought, and they'd cut, but what they they curtained it off. Anyway, news went out that uh, Dire Straits were actually going to go and play this concert and not let the fans down. We were just about to go on, and they, the promoter came in and said, you, "You can't go on yet. There's t- three thousand people outside who also want to come in." <laughs> yeah, you know, and so suddenly we realised. Well, your question about Germany, and where so suddenly you realise you weren't playing for two thousand people, you were playing to five and a half thousand people. And they literally all walked through the snow to get to that gig. There was no buses, there was no cars. And it was an extraordinary experience. And I suddenly thought, okay, I think something's happening here. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Inflection. And then we had to put all, all the stuff on the on the train and take it back down to Hamburg again. <laughs> wow. And what an Sweet. excellent story to... Uh, no, end our session with John. John, thank you so, so much. Uh, you, I know you have a painting waiting for you. Are you being painted or are you painting? No, I'm painting. I, I, I'm trying to paint a lion. Okay. Don't ask me why, but I'm, I'm painting a lion. We are behind you all the way. I am guessing we have come to the end of our session. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honor. Uh, I have to also say at this point of time, thank you to John Islesley for spending time with us. Thank you so much, John. Very nice to meet you all. Good luck with everything. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. uh, Yeah. uh, I'm so glad he he managed to join. And in these troubling and dark times, there's no other band I would turn to rather than Dire Straits. Thank you all so awesome. much. Have a good evening and Thank a you good guys. night. Thanks, Thank thanks a lot. Hi, I'm Bertie Aski and I'm stuck inside this box and they won't let me out until you share, like and subscribe to this channel. If you like what you saw in today's episode, come and join OD on Music. There's lots more good music coming your way.